The Second Karabakh War ended with Armenia's defeat with significant territorial losses and damaged infrastructure in Artsakh. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan failed to conquer the entire territory of the Republic of Artsakh. Around 3,000 square kilometers out of 4.4 thousand of the former Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region remained under Armenian control and de facto Russian protectorate. Russia and Turkey are now the key players in the region, while Western powers have been sidelined. The November 9 trilateral agreement of ceasefire stipulates a possibility of Russian peacekeepers' withdrawal every five years, but few believe that such a scenario is possible in the short run. The post-Soviet history proves that Russian soldiers do not leave territories they get into. Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria are good examples of it. Russia is going to create another military base in the South Caucasus, headquartered in Stepanakert, and will keep its presence there as long as possible. Given the establishment of the joint Russia-Turkey ceasefire monitoring center in Azerbaijan, some Turkish troops will be legally deployed in Azerbaijan too. The population living within the borders of the Russian protectorate will never accept Azerbaijani citizenship and will never agree to leave under Azerbaijani jurisdiction. The only way to establish Azerbaijani control over this 3,000 square kilometer of the territory is to start another war and to force the Armenian population to leave these territories. This scenario looks unrealistic, at least for the coming five years or even longer. The new status quo provides significant leverage for Russia to influence Armenian foreign and domestic policies. After the November 9 agreement, Armenia is much more dependent on Russia than any time after gaining independence in September 1991. This means that Armenia has few, if any, opportunities to continue any resemblance of balance or multi-vector foreign policy, which Yerevan, for better or worse, sought to pursue in the last 20-25 years. However, this does not mean that Armenia will cancel its comprehensive and enhanced partnership agreement with the EU, or will stop its cooperation with NATO within individual partnership action plans, but it means that all significant domestic and foreign policy decisions in Armenia will not be adopted without the approval of the Kremlin. Hello, uh, this is the last episode of Crossroad, and today we will discuss what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh and what uh, future lay there for Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. And uh, our today's guest is Pietro Shakarian. A PhD candidate in Russian history at the Ohio State University with a research focus on the history of Soviet Armenia. He joins us from Cleveland, United States. Pietro, good morning and thanks uh, for joining us. Uh, good morning, uh, Benjamin. It's excellent to be here. Uh, Pietro, first of all, I would like uh, to know your assessment. Uh, what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh since September 27 and how do you assess the current situation there? And then we will discuss uh, what we may see in 2021. So the current situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, I mean, going back to September 27th, you had, of course, the war. It was this massive attack launched by Turkey and Azerbaijan against uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh. And essentially for the Armenian forces, it ended in a loss, it ended in a defeat, as the Armenians would say, that this was not the best certainly Armenia could do in a war such as this. Um, and there were a lot of questions uh, that resulted from it. And uh, after, in the aftermath of the war, there was the signing of this November peace uh, statement, right, between Russia, or well, among Russia, Azerbaijan and Armenia. And it resulted in significant territorial losses, in addition to the losses already suffered during the war, which were in the south of Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, this also triggered a political crisis in Armenia that we're witnessing unfolding uh, right now, currently to this day. Uh, so, Petro, let's now discuss the role of great powers in current uh, situation, and especially the role of Russia and the Turkey, because we all know that they are the key players. So what do you think, what was the role of Russia during the war, after the war? What was the role of Turkey during the war, after the war? I think uh, Russia, historically, if we look back to 1990s, to the 1994 ceasefire, Russia has always been uh, playing the role of the regional referee, as I like to say, or the kind of the regional power broker. 
And uh, its main interest in the region is to kind of establish some peace and stability because a war in Nagorno-Karabakh and any kind of instability in Nagorno-Karabakh has very negative and grave implications for Russian security that impact uh, the neighboring regions of Russia, which is the Russian North Caucasus. So Russia does not want uh, any kind of war or conflict or instability in Nagorno-Karabakh. And in that way, it always kind of acted as, as I say, the referee. First in 1994 ceasefire, which they brokered, but then uh, we go to the 2016 war. They brokered the ceasefire for that. They attempted to broker the ceasefire uh, in this current war, there were actually three ceasefire attempts, and Azerbaijan did not adhere to those attempts. The first attempt uh, actually involved a 10-hour-plus negotiation by Sergei Lavrov, who is the Russian foreign minister. Then you had a second attempt at a ceasefire, which, as far as I know, involved uh, both the Russian Federation and France. And then you also had the third ceasefire attempted to be brokered by the United States, and that also fell apart. And then finally, you had Russia, you know, attempting a peace in which the Armenian forces would have to give concessions to Azerbaijan at that point after that subsequently. So the Russia has always kind of played the role of kind of the regional referee because it has interests in both Armenia and Azerbaijan. In the case of Turkey, Turkey has never played a neutral role. Turkey has always been 100% in support of Azerbaijan, but especially in recent years, it has taken that support to new levels. So in the 2016 war, we saw a preview of what we saw in the 2020 war. Turkey uh, began vocally supporting Azerbaijan. There was a concerted effort in, uh, at least in the United States, of lobbying uh, on behalf of Turkish uh, lobbying groups to uh, kind of that kind of were anticipating this war uh, in 2016 that were saying Armenia is an enemy of NATO, Armenia is kind of allied with Russia, and then you had this massive uh, assault, or actually I would say a pretty substantial assault, not as big as 2020, but uh, a significant assault on Nagorno-Karabakh in 2016, and Turkey was vocally supporting Azerbaijan. Erdogan, I think, I believe said, if I remember correctly, that, um, you know, uh, Turkey is supporting uh, Azerbaijan to the end, something to this extent. And in this war, that was elevated, that level of support was elevated to major logistical and military support. You had advisors on the ground, you had uh, Bayraktar Turkish drones being used in this war. So this was a much more significant level of Turkish involvement. Now they tested the waters, as I say, in 2016, but in 2020, this is when you really have the all out use of Turkish force in, in a conflict such as this. Now, as far as I know, and actually as according to my information, the Russian Federation was obviously aware of this buildup, and they were trying to notify the Armenian authorities about this scenario, and they were trying to warn them uh, about the potential uh, deadliness of this attack. And that is something we're still trying to uncover a lot of information, so we don't know the full extent of the behind the scenes politics, you know, so all we can do is try and draw conclusions based on the interests of these states, right, and their, their past behavior and also uh, on the history. And we can try to form as best a conclusion as we can. But I think that if we look at this, uh, we don't um, really have the full picture of actually what went on behind the scenes, but hopefully we will, and I think we're receiving more information. That's one of the most interesting things that in the aftermath of this war, more and more information has come out about the actual behind the scenes politics, and it's allowed us to kind of fill in the gaps of, of what we know about this uh, scenario. And Pietro, there are divergent views how we can assess the current situation in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, in Artsakh. Some people argue that uh, still we have Artsakh Republic or Nagorno-Karabakh Republic despite significantly with significantly reduced borders. But also there are experts who argue that now the territory which remains from Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, this approximately 3,000 square kilometer of territory, we cannot call it Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh Republic, we shall call it the Russian Protectorate. What is your views or what is your assessment? Can we say that still we have uh, Artsakh Republic, or we have just a Russian protectorate? I think, actually, to be quite honest with you, it's somewhere in between. I don't think it's fully, you know, like a Russian, I don't think it's fully like a Russian province. 
but neither do I think it is a, uh, you know, fully Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Um, it is still, you have Nagorno-Karabakh Republic doing um, kind of the uh, affairs of civil government, day-to-day -day governance, right? So it still has this function of, of governing uh, essentially the territories that it has jurisdiction over. Right. Now, there are some Russian analysts who even go so far as to say, well, the Russian peacekeeping force is just a peacekeeping force alone, uh, that it has no political significance. And I don't believe this. I think that, of course, when you have such a show of force in a region like Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh Republic, you're basically essentially making a political statement. You're making the statement that this is, uh, you know, our neck of the woods. This is a region where we have interests and we mean business here. So the Russians, they have, uh, I think, the, the Russians at the end of the day, they have the military force to protect Nagorno-Karabakh. They're the security guarantors of Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno-Karabakh defense forces, I don't think, are useless, useless either because they form kind of a, uh, kind of they form like a, um, a complementary uh, aspect in terms of the security dimension uh, of the uh, defense of the republic along with the Russian security forces. So. I mean, to answer your question in kind of a short form, I think it's a bit of both. You still have a government there in Nagorno-Karabakh, you still have civil institutions, but they coexist with this Russian peacekeeping force, which is very strong and which is the primary security guarantor of Nagorno-Karabakh. So I think, yes, it is. I think it's a, a mix of these two elements. And now, uh, the, maybe the last uh, question or last point of discussion. What may happen in 2021? Do you believe that the current uh, Femi stable situation will continue or maybe Azerbaijan will try to make some moves, steps or provocations against Russian peacekeepers because now a lot of Azerbaijan experts speak that okay we do not need only Russian peacekeepers at least we should bring peacekeepers from other states or maybe even go and receive mandate from OSC or even from United Nations. What will happen in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2021? What do you think? Well, it's hard to say because the situation is so unpredictable. So I'm a historian, and uh, historians can tell you that one constant in history is that it's unpredictable, right? So it's not, we, we can't say for sure what will happen, but we can follow the interests of states and make kind of a reasonable assessment of what they may do, right? So I think that Russia, you know, has a long-term interest in really kind of solidifying, securing, and enhancing its uh, its presence in Nagorno-Karabakh and also um, to kind of restore the balance of power that was so violated in this most recent war of 2020. How they will do that, I cannot say, but that is one uh, thing we have to keep in mind going forward, that Russia has that interest of enhancing its position and, and its status in Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, as for Azerbaijani provocations, I think that that is a real serious concern. And not only have, our, have Azerbaijani uh, commentators talked about this, but also, you know, Armenian analysts have warned about this, and also Russian analysts have warned about this, and Russian officials have warned about this. So I think, uh, I believe, even Vladimir Putin has warned about this, but also Russia's top uh, Caucasus analysts. You have Vadim Mukhanov, you have uh, Sergei Markdanov, these really excellent analysts of the Caucasus, excellent historians and political analysts, they are saying that there's a very serious threat of a provocation, a destabilization, a ceasefire violation, and a major ceasefire violation. So the situation is very fluid right now. The borders that we have right now in Nagorno-Karabakh are very unstable and difficult to defend. And so it's a very uncertain future. And I don't think we can say for sure uh, you know exactly how the situation will proceed, but we can say it it's going to be very very tenuous uh, moving forward on this uh, Thank you. Thank you Pietro for joining us from Cleveland. Thank you uh, for your time And I would like to tell that this was the last episode of Crossroad and we discuss the current situation and the possible developments in Nagorno-Karabakh Republic with Pietro Shakarian a PhD candidate in Russian history at the Ohio State University with a research focus on uh, history of Soviet Armenia. And also I would like to thank the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung for supporting Crossroad. Thank you.